Metroidvanias, we all know them. From the OGs of Metroid and Castlevania to modern classics like Hollow Knight, it's an incredibly fun genre to dig into and play. I always thought it would be cool to make one, and after recently playing the demo for Dewdrop Dynasty, I was especially inspired. But there's one big issue. Have you ever seen the maps for these things? Yeah, they're freaking huge. Ain't nobody got time for that. So I thought my dreams of making a Metroidvania were dead in the water. That is, until I came across this. It was amazing. Ascent is a Metroidvania made by Johan Peitz in Pico 8 for the 2022 Low Res Jam, who you may know as the creator of PicoCAD, a 3D modeling software for Pico 8. Not only was it fun, but most crucially, it was small. This is the map for Ascent. It looked like it was actually achievable, and I started to see a vision of how I could scratch that Metroidvania developer itch. I was going to create a Microvania. The first step was choosing a development environment to make the game in. Was I going to use Pico 8, like Ascent, or other game engines like Unity or Godot? Of course not. My platform of choice is the Playdate. I've been making things for the Playdate for the past year to learn game development, and I feel like I'm just getting the hang of this whole game development thing. So I was excited to try and push my skills forward. With idea in hand and platform chosen, I was ready to jumpstart my development. But right out of the gate, I hit my first roadblock. How the heck was I going to actually make the levels? Let me explain. In other game engines like Godot or Pico 8, you have built-in tile map editors that can allow you to create levels visually. Here's what the development environment for the Playdate looks like. It's all just code. But not all hope was lost. There are two heroes that came to save the day. The first is Sebastian Bernard, who you may know as the person who is the lead game designer and lead developer for the hit indie game Dead Cells. He made a tool called Level Designer Toolkit, also known as LDTK, that lets you create levels with incredible ease. That's only the first part though, since there needs to be a way for that data to be translated to a Playdate readable format. That's where the second hero comes in, Nick Magnier, who you may know as the developer of the Season 1 Playdate game Pick Pack Pup. He created a tool that translates LDTK levels to a Playdate readable format. With that, I was rescued and could finally start development. To begin, I threw together a quick test level to see if it loaded properly to the Playdate. It was looking like it worked, so the next step was to get a player character controller so I could move and jump around the level. This is where I had an ace up my sleeve. You see, I've been actually working on another platformer game before this. It was kind of an interesting concept. I built a level editor so you can make little levels, and it would generate a QR code, and you can scan the QR code to bring you to a website. And they can use their phone to beep out a code that can be picked up by the microphone of another playdate, and it would upload the level. This whole convoluted process was because there's no Wi-Fi API yet for the playdate SDK, so I had to find another way to share levels over the internet. I put this on hold for a while because of the holidays, but after coming back to it, I didn't really feel excited by the game anymore. No surprise here, I scrap projects all the time. I just threw it into the dead project graveyard that I have, but not before putting it into an ice bath and harvesting its organs for the platformer character controller I made. Here's the platformer controller in action in the game. There's currently no way to traverse different rooms, which you might imagine could be a little difficult to implement, but I had an idea. My plan was to detect when the player hits the edge of the screen and check if there's a neighboring level. If there was, I would simultaneously load the new level and teleport the player to the opposite side of the screen, maintaining its state and momentum, so it would look like you just walked into the next room. Turns out it worked much better than I expected, so I was quite happy with it. But I wasn't out of the woods yet. I needed to do a quick performance check on device, since the performance on the computer and the performance on the playdate could differ drastically. I was having some serious frame dropping issues on another project I was working on concurrently, so I was worried that maybe level loading would be slow and the game would stutter. But testing it on device revealed that it was super quick, not even noticeable. Nice job, Nick. Let's get to adding some level elements. A common level element in these sorts of games is a ladder to give some verticality to levels. You would think that this would be easy to implement, but apparently not. Or maybe I'm just an idiot. The problem is that there's a lot of design considerations around a ladder. When you're climbing it and touch the ground, it should release you from the ladder. When you jump, you should be able to jump off the ladder. You should be able to jump towards the ladder and press up or down to grab the ladder. The ladder has to be a solid and non-solid block because you should be able to walk over the ladder and press down to grab it or continue walking over it. What if you start holding the up button before you touch the ladder? Obviously, it should buffer your grab input. And of course, climbing to the top should release you from the ladder as well. So many considerations that have to be accounted for. Well, 
After a bunch of trial error and hair pulling, I managed to get it all working. But it's still not a perfect solution. There's a slight stutter because of a microscopic ledge between the surrounding collision boxes. Oh well, nobody's perfect. I was ready to leave this horrible experience behind me to work on something a little more interesting. What I would consider the hallmark of any metroidvania is the abilities that you can unlock to allow you to get access to the new regions. The famous example is the Samus Morph Ball ability, which allows you to get into narrow holes and progress further into the game. Of course, I had to have some abilities as well, so I got started on my first one, the wall climb. This wasn't nearly as hard as the ladder to implement, but came with its own challenges. I first created a new animation for climbing, then I made it so when you touched a climbable wall, it would latch you onto it and switch the player into a climbing state. If you jumped, it would initiate a wall jump by giving you horizontal and vertical velocity directed away from the wall. Next ability was the double jump, a classic. Pretty easy, just creating a flag that checks if you have a double jump and initiating another jump in the air and resetting the flag when you touch the ground. Third ability was the dash, which is something I love as a movement option in games. Not too difficult either, basically like an adjusted jump, but with less vertical and a lot more horizontal velocity. I felt like a bird, soaring freely in the sky. After that, I wanted to give the crank some use in the game, so I thought the perfect candidate would be one of those portcullis things as a gate, and the ability to crank and pull up the gate. Everything was looking really good on device, and it was pretty satisfying just moving around and using all the different abilities. But I had one last ability to implement. I wanted some sort of smash attack that could destroy certain blocks around you as another way to gate progression to another section. I started off by creating another animation for this ground smash attack, and I went into Pixel FX Designer to create some particle effects for the smash. Simulating particles through code on device is somewhat performance intensive, so it's better to pre-draw the particles into a bunch of different images. Here's what it looks like all together in game. I was pretty happy with how it turned out, so next was adding some blocks to break. As you can see, I added some particle effects to the blocks as well. At this point, however, I was getting pretty annoyed at something. You see, every time I exported a sprite sheet from Pixel FX Designer, I had to go through a laborious process in A-Sprite that involved opening the palette, changing the color mode, exporting the sprite sheet, and renaming the file. An entire four-step manual process that took a whole 15 agonizing seconds. As you know, why spend 15 seconds doing something when you can spend hours automating it? So I discovered that A-Sprite has a scripting API and decided to spend an afternoon learning a little about it. After a bit of time, I put together a short script that takes the output sprite sheet and automatically converts it into a playdate readable format. Now, I can finally close all these tabs. After that little detour, I wanted to put it to the test with a death animation. But first, I need to implement something that could kill you. I decided to go with simple spikes and these spike balls that move. I set it up in a way where you can set the location of the spikes and how fast you want the spike balls to move in LDTK, so I made iterating on these hazards really quick. At this point, dying was a really jarring experience, so it was time to add a death animation. First, I put together another particle effect. And then I made it so when you hit a hazard, there would be a slight freeze frame before you reset back to the beginning to really highlight what happened. I also made it so the room wouldn't reset either, since the spikes flicking back to their starting position was a little strange. At this point, I had all the platforming mechanics in place, but was missing some elements to tie all the different parts together. The first of those would be a way to unlock abilities. I decided to go with the classic chest that you can open. You can see here that I currently don't have the wall climb ability, but if I open the chest, it brings up a dialogue that tells me I've unlocked a new ability. Now, the wall climb ability is enabled. The UI was looking a little out of place, so I changed it up a bit to try to make it look a little better. Next, I had the idea to add NPCs that you can talk to. So the first step was to add a little pop-up text box. It was working okay, but here's where I started going down a path that led to me wasting hours of my time and about 50% of my sanity. Here was the issue. Did you catch it? For some reason, this is a huge pet peeve of mine when text boxes do this thing where the word wrapping changes partway through the drawing of the text. In other game engines, this is actually a pretty easy fix. Usually there's some sort of percent visible variable that you can adjust to write out the text. How this manages to fix the issue is that all the text is actually pre-written, but the text that hasn't been displayed yet is just made invisible. So the word wrapping is all pre-calculated. You can see how the two different systems compare side by side. As you can see on the left, it can be quite jarring if you don't address it. There's no built-in system to do that for the Playdate SDK, so I spent hours trying to hack together a solution, but it just was not working for me. So I accepted defeat and went with a compromise solution, which was to circumvent the issue entirely and put everything on one line. Yeah, turns out word wrapping got hands. 
Next step was to create a dialogue system that puts the speech boxes above the NPC and player heads. It was looking alright, but it was sort of hard to tell who was who, so I added a little arrow to point to whoever is speaking. I set up the dialogue system to interface with the LDTK, so I can add an NPC and all the dialogue in there, and it'll automatically propagate to the game on the play date. With that finished, let's move on. I find often in Metroidvania games, the pause screen has a display that shows you what abilities you have unlocked. I really wanted that in my game. And luckily, the Playdate has a cool system that allows you to overwrite the pause screen. Normally, it just fades out what the game looks like, but you can replace it with a custom image of your choice. Games like Inventory Hero use this to show what items you have equipped. I wanted to implement this in my game, so I created a little UI screen for what it would look like and updated the image whenever you picked up a new ability. You can see when I have no abilities, it's empty, but once I pick up an ability, it populates the pause screen. This was a nice bit of polish that didn't take that long to implement, so I recommend trying it out for your own Playdate games. Speaking of polish, there was these nice waterfall tiles in the asset pack I was using, so I wanted to add that as a nice coat of polish. But I wanted to add a twist. Previously, I made a fishing game for the Playdate, and added some basic fluid sim to create some waves. The performance wasn't that great on device, but later, I found another fluid sim library by Dustin Moreau that worked great. I used that later on in my tennis game to make this wobbly net that reacts to the ball passing through it. I really like using it, so my thought was that I can accent the low-res pixel art with that higher resolution water simulation and it might look pretty cool. First step was to add the waterfall. I created some entities in LDTK and animated the waterfalls in the game. Then I went back in and used the water sim library to add some water to the section that I blacked out in the level editor. You can see that there are impulses in the water wherever the waterfalls are, and there's also this ripple effect whenever the player jumps into the water. Of course, I couldn't miss this opportunity to add a hidden cave behind the waterfall. Watch out for these blocks that look slightly different and you might find a secret passageway. Continuing on with the polish, I wanted to add some decorations around the place. There's a cool feature in LDTK that allows you to procedurally add decoration by setting some rules. I have it set to where 20% of the time, a block will have some grass or chains connecting to it as some decoration. The last game element I wanted to add was some sort of pickup, and for some reason, I decided that it should be cheese. I eventually hid cheese all over the map as some sort of optional pickup, so you can try to find all the cheese in the game. Next step was to add the sound effects for the game. I spent about a day and a half putting them all together. It included a little bit of this, and also a little bit of this, And lastly, a little bit of that. Now that all the mechanics were in place, it was time for the fun part, putting all the levels together. So I spent the next couple of days putting together an entire map. I tried to include classic Metroidvania tropes, such as branching paths that you have to backtrack to once you've unlocked certain abilities, hidden areas, challenging platforming, and a random storyline about how you ate the King's Royal cheese. One thing I didn't manage to add was some enemies that you could fight, but maybe I'll try that next time. I also ended up doing this thing where every room you find an ability chest is one with water and a waterfall. It just seemed right to do that. The playtime ends up being around 20 to 30 minutes. I then added a title screen and called the game The King's Dungeon, and added music into the game. For the title music and end screen music, someone in my Discord channel, Sam Play, made a couple of songs for me. Speaking of a Discord channel, you should definitely join. I'm in there talking to people every single day. For the game music, I use a song I found on Open Game Art. Game is now out on itch.io. If you don't have a Playdate, you can also download the Playdate Simulator to play on your PC, though it's a bit of a different experience. Make sure to check that you're subscribed to the channel to catch more Playdate development content, and see you next time.